All right, let's talk about vapor pressure and blowing force, and more specifically how intermolecular forces affect these, because that is kind of the theme of the unit, is how do the intermolecular forces shape the properties we see in a substance. So uh, for you copying this, the best way to do this is fill in what needs to be filled in uh, as you pause the video, and then once you're done with that, then play to hear the explanation. So with this, we need to consider what's being said here, this balance between the kinetic energy and the attractive forces. What do I mean by that? We're going to say that atoms are like magnets. And I've got two kinds of magnets, strong silvery colored neodymium magnets and much weaker just regular old black magnets here. I think these are iron based. Um, these things are good analogies here, especially with this part here. Particles with weak intermolecular forces evaporate more easily than particles with strong intermolecular forces. So let's start with these black magnets here. These dark colored magnets are like weak intermolecular force particles, as in like they don't stick together very strong. I mean, they do stick, just they're not very strong, so it's super easy to pull them apart. There's not much resistance. So when particles are bouncing around inside of the air, they're pulling each other together through their intermolecular forces, but they're also kind of, because they're moving, there's a tendency to come apart. When the forces holding together are stronger, they stay together, and that's what a liquid is. When the forces pulling them apart are stronger, they separate, and that's what turning from a liquid into a gas is when the particles separate. So these magnets are holding each other together like the particles in a liquid. Now, if you get them excited with enough force to pull them apart, of course they separate, and so these weak ones separate very easily because they have weak intermolecular forces compared to uh, something with strong intermolecular forces would be like very strong magnets. These neodymium magnets are pretty strong. It is possible to separate them, but it takes a lot more force and concentration. It's not so easy. So this is like molecules that have strong intermolecular forces. They stick together really well, and they don't separate so easily. So likewise, molecules with strong intermolecular forces stick together strongly, and they don't separate very easily, which means they don't evaporate easily, because evaporation is like when you pull these magnets apart. So things that don't evaporate very easily tend to have strong intermolecular force because they're sticking together. Things that evaporate very easily tend to have weak intermolecular forces because they're not sticking together very well. Okay, so uh, I'm going to copy that down. And we can mention that one of the factors that's pulling particles apart is, again, their energy. And it's a saying that as you increase the temperature, like from going from the green, blue to the red, you're increasing the energy of the particles. That's kind of like pulling more strongly these particles apart. So if I pull these more strongly apart, well, of course they're going to apart very easily. This is like the weak intermolecular forces. These are the weak magnets. These strong magnets, raising the temperature is like, well, pulling harder. So they'll come apart more easily if I just, well, pull harder. Um, so likewise, even stuff that doesn't evaporate easily, get it warm enough, it'll start evaporating faster because you're increasing the percentage of particles that have enough energy to separate. So given that, we have to understand that there's this balance, it's always a balance, and that you're just shifting it a little bit by raising the temperature toward more particles being able to separate and therefore able to evaporate. And that, of course, is why with the obvious that things evaporate faster at higher temperature. This is why. At higher temperature, the particles more easily separate. Okay, so this is something else to copy down. Copy this, and then also copy this. So, vapor pressure is a way of putting a number on this stuff. Particularly when it has to do with um, this stuff right here, the strength of the intermolecular forces. It's a way of putting a number on it. Here's why. I said that weaker particle, or particles with weaker intermolecular forces evaporate more easily because they separate more easily. Particles with strong intermolecular forces evaporate less easily and more slowly because they pull together more strongly and it's just more difficult to separate them. So, how do we put a number on that? We have to consider that 
there's this thing called vapor pressure. More vapor pressure means evaporating more. Less vapor pressure means evaporating less. That's essentially what vapor pressure is all about. That's what this is saying. So what does that mean? Well, take a liquid, put it in a container, seal the container, and then after you seal it, the particles of, or the liquid inside will start to evaporate. It'll evaporate, vapor will build up. At some point, so much will build up that it'll start condensing back down into liquid again, and these processes will happen at the same speed in opposite directions in a balance that we call equilibrium, where the evaporation happens at the same rate as condensation, thus meaning that the level of the liquid inside will not change because it is evaporating at the exact same rate that it is condensing. When it does that, some pressure builds up, and that pressure that builds up again is what's called the vapor pressure. So, strong intermolecular forces, because they don't evaporate all that well, because they're unable to separate themselves all that well, means low vapor pressure because there's not much vaporization going on. Strong intermolecular, or weak intermolecular forces separate easily because there's less attraction. So they evaporate more easily. They evaporate faster, which makes more vapor pressure. So we tend to see high vapor pressure for weak intermolecular forces, low vapor pressure for strong intermolecular forces. Notice what I just said is right here. Okay, what I was just talking about is the reason why. Take a moment to write this down. And actually, I just realized, uh, I forgot there's another point here. Write that down too. Okay. So, um, when it comes to this, we have to understand a few things. One, this must be memorized. Liquids boil when vapor pressure equals surrounding pressure. I think in some old versions of the notes it says atmospheric pressure. Change it to say this if it does. Because atmospheric pressure um, is not as general a descriptor as this. Surrounding pressure can be inside a pressure cooker. It could be inside a vacuum chamber. It can be anywhere in space, on the earth, on another planet, whatever. It's just more general. Um, and it better describes what's going on because... Here's the thing, we look at a graph like this, and this tells us how we can predict the boiling point of any substance. And it shows like um, the vapor pressure of a substance, of these different substances right here. So what do we need to get out of this? What do we need to do here? Well, first of all, there's some memorization that happens, okay? Now, we can kind of reason our way through this. If the forces hold together strongly, they don't evaporate much, that's low vapor pressure. If they um, don't hold together very strongly, then they evaporate easily, which means they're evaporating a lot. That's high vapor pressure. Let's see, the other, that's this right here, which means low boiling point. Um, so what do we actually do with this graph? Well, in a separate video, I'll show you how to read like boiling point off the graph or what pressure is needed to make a boiling point or what boiling point like if given a pressure for the boiling point, or given a boiling point for it, what pressure it must be. Um, so that's a topic for a different video. But for our purposes, what we need to understand is what this graph is showing about vapor pressure itself. Notice water, for example, at 20 degrees Celsius, its vapor pressure is way down here. At 40 degrees Celsius, this is a higher vapor pressure, okay? Higher temperature, higher vapor pressure. At 60 degrees, it's higher. At 80 degrees, it's even higher. At 100 degrees, it's even higher. And the higher the temperature, the higher the vapor pressure. Raise the temperature, the stuff evaporates more. Now consider at this, let's pick a temperature. Let's say at 60 degrees Celsius, there's four substances and they're all on here in some degree or another. At 60 degrees Celsius, this ethylene glycol has a vapor pressure of almost zero. It's super low. Water has a higher vapor pressure. This alcohol has even higher vapor pressure still. And this red stuff, it is something at 60 degrees Celsius, but it's somewhere way off the chart. So this is even higher still. So at 60 degrees Celsius, this is lowest vapor pressure, higher, higher, highest. At 40 degrees Celsius, this isn't even there. It's basically zero for this substance right here. Water's is higher. Ethylene alcohol is even higher still, and this Diethyl ether is even higher still. In other words, and actually, back up a second. At 20 degrees Celsius, this stuff is basically zero. Water is a little bit higher. Ethylene alcohol is higher, and diethyl ether is higher. 
In other words, at any temperature, this is always the highest vapor pressure, this is always second highest, this is always second lowest, and this is always lowest vapor pressure. So when we talk about something having a higher or low vapor pressure, it's true at all temperatures, not just one, not just at a particular temperature, it's true at all of them. So it's a characteristic that's always true because we can relate it to their properties. Looking at this, we can say because at 20 degrees Celsius or 40 or 60 or 80 or 100, this is always the highest vapor pressure, this has weakest intermolecular forces. On the other hand, if, okay, again, because at any given temperature, if the, void, if the vapor pressure of this is here, the vapor pressure of this stuff is lower, and this stuff is even lower still, and this stuff is like zero. So because this always has the lowest vapor pressure, we're going to say, oops, we guessed intermolecular forces. Hopefully that's visible on screen, so, but yeah, weakest, oh my goodness, why did I say weakest? Strongest intermolecular forces. Okay, strongest intermolecular forces, weakest intermolecular forces. This would be like the second strongest, third strongest, fourth strongest, or weakest, second weakest, third weakest, fourth weakest, you know, that kind of thing. There's various ways to phrase it, but it all gets at the same idea. Okay, so... Um, given that, we can look at one more thing. There's another vocabulary term called volatility that gets at the same thing. So this is the same graph as before, right here. So volatile is how much it evaporates. So highly volatile, imagine like a highly volatile person is known for like quickly changing a one minute their best friend, the next they're screaming at you. Um, that's a highly volatile personality because volatility means able to change quickly. In this case, change from liquid to salt or liquid to gas, which means high volatility means evaporating quickly, and evaporating quickly means high vapor pressure. So now we got to do that kind of couple of mental steps. So high vapor pressure makes high volatility. Well, high vapor pressure comes from evaporating quickly. Evaporating quickly comes from weak intermolecular forces. So that's what this is from here, right here. We can check your forces, make it evaporate faster. Faster evaporation equals higher vapor pressure. Higher vapor pressure, more volatility. Here, stronger intermolecular forces make it evaporate slower. Slower evaporation means low vapor pressure. Low vapor pressure, low volatility. So if this has the lowest vapor pressure, this is also the least volatile. This right here would be the most volatile. Make sure to label these on your graph on your handout also because it helps to make extra clear, particularly when you're studying for a test later. All right. So this is, there are so also some picture files that help kind of reinforce some of these ideas. Let's see, let me check one thing. Make sure, okay. Yeah, there are some other pictures that kind of reinforce these ideas, like it tells you why vapor pressure must be equal to atmospheric pressure, aka surrounding pressure, in order to boil. Um, notice like the list of like, okay, lower pressure, lower boiling point, higher pressure, higher boiling point. And then, this is interesting, take some time to look at this. Basically, it's an explanation of why water boils at lower temperatures at higher elevations and lower pressures, or boils at higher temperatures, at lower elevations, and higher pressures. All right, so, and of course, also make sure that you're familiar with all the things you need to be familiar with. And that should take care of that for now. <laughs>